Well, I'm honored to be up here continuing our series in 1 Peter. Like Pastor Jeff said, we are in chapter 3, so you can go ahead and turn there, starting in verse 1. Uh, pray for us this week. We leave today for high school camp. So God is going to move mightily. I will be sleeping on the bus on the floor after preaching three services, so pray for everyone else who's in charge. 1 Peter 3, verses 1 through 7. In the same way, you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. Other translations say, wives, submit to your husbands. Then even if they refuse, or even if some refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. They will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. Don't be concerned about the outward beauty of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. You should clothe yourselves instead with the beauty that comes from within and the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. This is how the holy women of old uh, made themselves beautiful. They put their trust in God and accepted the authority of their husbands. For instance, Sarah obeyed her husband Abraham and called him her master, you are daughters when you do what is right without fear of what your husbands might do. In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner. Turn your neighbor and say, equal partner. Equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should so your prayers will not be hindered. Let's pray. Jesus Thank you for this morning that we get to meet with you. Would you open our hearts and our minds? Uh, and I, I thank you, God, and we celebrate that your truth sets us free. And so, God, may your truth go forth uh, and not return void. We thank you for what you have in store in your mighty name. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. So this morning, as Pastor Jeff said, I'm tackling the first half of this chapter, husbands and wives, and if you're married, not married, uh, um, all the above, looking, not looking, before, after. This applies to you this morning. This applies to you. I believe as we lay the foundation and, and get to the root of uh, what Peter's goal is with this chapter, uh, you will be challenged. Um, and so uh, I'm just gonna encourage you to let the Holy Spirit speak to you because at the end of service, we wanna open the altars uh, up front. And if you are, are in here and you're like, man, I, I wanna respond to Jesus for the first time, I wanna submit my life to him, we challenge you to come. If you want, if your marriage is doing fantastic or it's not, we want you to come and be prayed over and pray with each other so that you can have power in it because that's what God's word says. If you, if, if, if you want to, um, have any need be prayed for, any need, whether it appeals to this or applies to this sermon or not, we wanna pray for you. We know that this altar is a place that, it's an, in, in, it's an outward expression of an inward sign of God, I'm chasing after you, I want what you have for me and my family and my life, and so this shouldn't be a place of shame, it should be a place of freedom. There shouldn't be any judgment that says, oh, I don't know if I should go up because what if people think this? Who cares? Who cares? God has freedom for us in this place. So I want to prepare you for that. Just prepare you and prepare your hearts as we dive in. But let me set the foundation of this letter written by Peter. It was written to uh, Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey and all the churches there. Uh, it was written specifically to non-Jewish Christians facing persecution, facing persecution in, in their culture. And Peter's goal was to encourage them through different avenues and different uh, and ways that they live their lives that, that their suffering could be a witness. Their countercultural uh, way that they're called to live could be a witness to bring people to Jesus. And so as we dive into this first passage that we get hung up so many times in our culture, in our day and age today, uh, it can be this wives submit, this word submit, we get hung up on a lot. Uh, it can be offensive, it can be challenging, and so a lot of times we just kind of go and move through it. But I know that this, this chapter has deep meaning for us this morning, and so it has been used negatively 
I know and I've seen examples been used negatively to oppress and, and, and abuse uh, women and wives. And, and, but I challenge you, don't throw it out with, you know, don't, the, there is something for us there this morning. But we can't go into this text looking, as, looking at it as a 21st century American. We just can't. And, and here's why. So I've had the privilege of being to travel uh, all over the world, mission trips, just traveling. And there's been places that I go to and each country or each context or culture is different. And, and I have to be mindful as I'm going into those places as an American that they're different. They're different. So for instance, in Kenya, you are not allowed to use your left hand for pretty much anything. Why? Because your left hand is considered your bathroom hand. You use in the bathroom. And so it's very disrespectful, it's offensive, it's gross to that culture to use it for anything. Shaking a hand, eating, writing. That was incredibly hard for a high schooler who is a lefty in everything. My pastor, when we went on that trip, everywhere we went that was in public, even in church, he would make me sit on my hand because it's just natural for me to like, even in church, like raising my hand, like that's a no-no in that culture. Also, you see men all the time in that culture, they, they will interlock hands and they'll walk down the road holding hands and you're kind of like, oh, that's interesting. Uh, but it actually is just a, a sign of really great friendship. That's what it is, two men holding hands. So now you know with, when you see Pastor Zach and Pastor August in the office doing their thing, holding hands, you know. Now you know, just good friends. Just really, really good friends. So in Thailand, if you go to Thailand, I know that if you point at someone using your foot, it is very disrespectful. It's offensive. You don't do that. You don't point at anything using your feet. If you, in El Salvador, if you wanna tell a child or somebody to come here, you actually do it like this, underhanded. Why? Because in that culture, prostitutes solicit men going like this. So they don't want any part of it. So that's cultural training we have to teach our kids when we go to bring them on a missions trip. Do this, this is a no-no, don't do that, okay? But I'm going into that culture as an American and I could be, you know, I could go into there and say, well, I'm from America and this is American culture and I'm gonna do whatever I want and you know what, that's the wrong way to look at it and you know what, it's not, it's not disrespectful in my culture so I'm gonna point at whoever I want with my foot, you know? I would offend people, I wouldn't be able to be a part of that culture properly. The same thing applies to how we approach scripture. The Bible is not a 21st century American book. It's not, it's not even close to that. Can I get an amen, Pastor Gary? It's not, it's not even close to that. So I cannot approach it as a 21st century American. It is a Jewish, Jewish earlier than first century and even applies to Greek and Roman contexts. And so what I need to do is, when I'm going and approaching the Bible, any part of scripture, I have to understand, and you may have heard this before, but the Bible was not written to you, it was written for you. It is God's plan for you and it applies for you, but you are not the original audience of those texts, of those letters, of the, of the verses and the chapters. There was an original audience and so what I have to do is I have to throw my current culture aside and I dive into the culture of that day and I say what did it mean for them? Then I get to apply what it means for me. Does that make sense? We tracking? Everyone good? And so we have to do that with this chapter with this chapter once again if i just said women submit women submit in our culture it's offensive it's offensive but if i look at that culture of that day man there's there's a lot of power to these verses there's a lot of power and so um let's look at their context like i said it's non-jewish christians that were a part of the roman empire part of the Roman Empire. And in the Roman world, the man, the patriarch of the family had all authority. Wives, slaves, mistresses, concubines were all beneath him, well beneath him. He was the end all, be all. And women were just less than in that culture. They were, and at times slaves were even elevated greater than wives were. At times women were just considered property. 
And, and so we see in this, in our culture, we see this word submit being, say, oh, you just need to be obedient. You don't have a voice. You can't say anything. You can't do anything. And it kind of gives this connotation that women are inferior to men. Does the Bible really say that women are inferior to men? Well, let's answer that, and we're gonna start from the beginning in Genesis chapter one. Let's look at God's design for men and women. And in verse 27, it says, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Eve was not created in the image of Adam. She was created in the image of God. Yes, she came from Adam, but she wasn't less than. They were both valued equally to God. I find it significant that God didn't take a bone from Adam's head to try to make the woman above Adam. He did not take a bone from Adam's foot to try to signify that the woman was under or beneath Adam. But what did he take? He took a rib to signify equality, to signify equal value side by side. As Peter says, and I quote, equal partners, equal partners. Continue to the next chapter in Genesis chapter two, verse 18. It says, then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. Can we just really look at that first phrase for a second? Ladies, wives, this is your opportunity to celebrate the freedom that the truth of God brings and relish in it for a minute. God himself said, ah, look at this guy. I don't know if I should leave him alone. <laughs> Amen, Robin. I don't, know, I don't know if it's good for him if I left him alone. Uh, I don't know what would fully happen in the garden if we left him by himself. That wouldn't be good. Would he survive? We don't know. We don't know. Would the garden get destroyed? I don't know, maybe. God said this guy needs a little help. And I, I, have, I have put together some pictures that I believe God was thinking of when he made this statement. And I'd like to call this montage, the reason why women live longer than men. Number one, not the smartest choices being made. If you can't tell, that is a giant gallon of water cut in half to use as a safety mask. Next one. And this ingenuity is saying, why would I use straps when I have arms? God has gifted me straps on my body. Go ahead to the next one. If you can't see, there's a sign in the back that says, poison, no eating or drinking. Let's put a buffet right next to it. I don't see any women in this picture. No women. Next one, my personal favorite. I have a problem that we don't have a ladder, but we have each other. Those are five guys. This is, this, uh, this is picture of the garden, 20%, you know. This is what would happen. And the last one. Makes sense. I'm not gonna lean the ladder on the tr tree that I'm I don't know, that could have been the tree of good and evil, who knows. <laughs> this guy needs some help. This guy needs some help. But in all seriousness, all of creation was listed as good except for Adam not having a suitable helper, not having an equal for him. And God said, I will give him someone good. Now we can take that word helper and think, oh, a little sidekick, it's like my little buddy that comes. You know, like bringing a kid to the job, like they just kind of are there. But that's not what the actual word means. If you break down the word in Hebrew, it's azer, E-Z-E-R. It's all over the Old Testament and used in different references. But my favorite is 16 times in the Old Testament, this same word is used in reference, and I quote, the God, the one who helps. Same word that is described as woman, as the helper is used for God who helps. Does that seem like a sidekick word? Does that seem like a lowly word? The noun actually used there throughout the Old Testament doesn't suggest helper as in servant, but help as in savior, rescuer, protector, 
and God is our help. That's a powerful word. That is a powerful word. That's not a sidekick word. I love John Walton and his commentary says when, when talking about Azer, he said in the Old Testament, nothing suggests a subservient status of the one helping. In fact, the opposite is more likely. The opposite is more likely. Certainly, the helper can be understood as a perfect complement of leader. Leader. God did not create woman the helper as less than Adam, as less than the man. They are equally valuable, equally valuable in God's eyes. And so fast forward to our text in, in chapter three of First Peter. This word submit, it has a connotation of less than, but that's not the actual, what the actual word means. If you look at the Greek word for this is, apologize Pastor Gary, forgive me, for trying to pronounce this. Hupo tasomai, praise God. This is a combination of the verb tasso and the prefix hupo. And what we might miss right away is pl- in, in applying it to our context today is that this was actually a military term for arranging soldiers in an ordered formation to confront a common enemy. Sound like a subservient word not to me it actually could be translated as to set to arrange to order or deploy and the grammar of it is important too because the ending of the word tells us that we are in the passive middle voice which means deploy yourself under see what we're talking about with this word submit It's not this ancient Greek word for abstract obedience, but a concrete metaphor of military support and military order. This passage is not about obedience, it's about support. It's about support, which I understand, yes, obedience comes in with that, but the main focus as a wife to submit to her husband was to come under and support like a military order. There's a lot of power behind that word. That doesn't imply a less than, an inferior anything. I like to think of it as this could be said, wives, support your husbands. Wives, deploy yourselves under in support of your husbands. Wives, arrange yourselves for battle for your husbands. Well, you may be sitting here saying, well, what if What if he doesn't serve Jesus? What if he doesn't treat me right? What if he does this or that? Peter was actually talking specifically to wives with unbelieving husbands and to encourage them that through through that submission, through that support of them, coming alongside, coming under, was the way that they were gonna lead these unbelieving husbands to Christ. See, even if the man is the head of the household, it doesn't mean that he's better or more valuable or even more important because authority doesn't mean value. Submission doesn't limit value or limit impact. Submission doesn't mean inferior. It doesn't. So wives have a very powerful, strong job that Peter is calling them to, to impact their husbands and I believe their house and the people around them as we look in the context of this letter to reach people for Christ. Husbands, you're up. You're on the chopping block. What does Peter say about you and about me? In 1 Peter, continuing verse seven, it says, in the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should so your prayers will not be hindered. Equal partner, so that your prayers will not be hindered. See, this charge from Peter comes after the book of Ephesians, which Paul wrote, and and, and it is a reference to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter five, talking about husbands and wives, the same type of thing. And Paul says this in verse 21, of chapter five of Ephesians, he says, and further, submit to one another. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Continue in verse 25. 
For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church, without spot or wrinkle or any blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church, and we are members of his body. See, this in Ephesians, in this chapter in 1 Peter, it wouldn't have been very shocking or ultimately super challenging for the woman, for the wife. As we look back in context, they had to do that all the time. They had to be, they were automatically under in culture. So it wasn't much different for what Peter was telling them to do. They already had to deal with being less than on, an, on a regular basis. So coming in support of wasn't asking too much. But when Peter and Paul turned their attention to the men in a world surrounded around the man, who could have concubines and mistresses and whoever he wanted. A, 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 a phrase like your body belongs to your wife. Submit to one another. That would have been radical. That would have been incredibly shocking and challenging to the husbands of that culture. To serve and love their wives in the way that Peter was talking about. To submit to one each other. That was countercultural. That was countercultural. In fact, these requirements that, Paul, or that Peter placed on the husband are much greater than what he placed on the wife. Men are to be like Christ is to the church. What does that mean? Give your life for her. The language used for a man in his role is much more demanding and sacrificial than it is for the wife. And when talking about Christ in the church, the language used isn't a talk of a master and a servant, but of a lover and a beloved. I love that. See, a man, he's supposed to love and lead sacrificially, placing his wife's needs above his own. The man was tasked with leadership of the home. He was the head of the home. And what does it mean in Christ's world to be the head leader? It means to be the head servant. It means to be the lead servant, the lead submitter. And as the man submitted to Christ, he would then submit to his wife. That was radical in that culture. And it would have stuck out like a city on a hill. It would have had an impact, not just in the homes, but around in the culture. But husbands, we set the standard on how we submit. We set the standard on how wives submit because true submission starts with the husband. Because here's the deal, leadership does not mean lordship. Leadership does not mean lordship. I don't lord over my wife. Yes, I have authority, but I don't have dominion. I'm not her king. And, and I love that Christ had all authority he was the king of kings, he was Lord, and yet he led as a servant. So even the guy that could have Lord, and did have lordship, he led with servitude. We lead the same way by serving and sacrifice. And I know biblically, whenever it talks about leadership, there's always a greater responsibility and accountability. And that's what we have as a mantle as husbands. Now, does this mean that the wife isn't a leader? Absolutely not. She is a leader. She just isn't the leader. She is a leader. She still has impact. She still has power. Just like these phrases we broke down as helper and what does it mean to come alongside in military fashion to fight a common enemy. There is still power in that. And let me challenge you, if you're a single mother in the place and the husband has dropped his responsibility as the lead servant, you still have incredible power. It doesn't mean your, ho your house is doomed. God will still use you. We still see so many kids that have single, come from single parent homes, specifically single moms, 
that live incredibly powerful lives because the, the women, the wives step up to the mantle and they lead because the wife is still a leader. The wife is still a leader. But we as husbands, we are the leader. And Peter charged husbands in this way for the purpose of being an effective witness. Being an effective witness. It would have gone against everything that that culture stood for. So how impactful for people surrounding these marriages to see a man be submissive to a, hus- or a wife, incredibly impactful. They, they would know something's different. What a witness for serving Jesus. In our culture today, can I tell you, almost 50% of marriages end in divorce. Almost half. If you want to be countercultural, if you want to have an impact in our culture, start submitting to each other. Because it's not happening in culture. It's not the norm of us submitting to each other as husbands and wives. It doesn't happen. Men, we need to sacrifice for our wives. And wives, you need to come in full support of your men. And I challenge you, you will have such impact. It'll be easy to stick out if you show this to the world. It's not easy to do, but it will be easy for you to be a light and impactful in this area with how many broken marriages and broken homes we live and have in. And we need to stand up as men and lead the way in this. You may have heard the statistic, but it, it says if, if, if women get saved, if a woman gets saved, goes back to her house, it's a 30 to 40% chance that her whole household will be saved. But if a man gets saved and goes back to his house, it is a 90% chance that his whole household will be saved. That doesn't discount a woman's impact, but it just does show me that there is an order to God's creation and we have a mantle as men and as husbands that we need to take up and run in charge with. We are in charge of our homes. The ministry that we have to our homes is first and foremost. Your pastoral staff here, it is not my job to be the minister of your home. It is your job. It's your job, yes, do we come alongside you? Do we equip you to do the ministry? Absolutely. I love your kids with all all my heart, but I cannot be the minister to your home. I just can't be. God has created that with design, with intentionality to that. And we need to lead the way. No longer passive, we live in a culture with just passive men. Just passive men. This is not new. Look at Adam and Eve in the garden. When Satan was doing his work and talking to Adam and Eve, what was Adam doing? It references him as just being there. He didn't do anything. And in Romans, I believe it's chapter 12, it says, through the sin of Adam, everyone is a sinner. It doesn't say through the sin of Eve. It says through the sin of Adam. Did Eve sin? Yes. But the Bible makes it clear, he had a role, he had a job, and he dropped the ball. And we can't do that in our marriages, we can't do that in our homes. Worship team, would you come? I feel like most guys, most dads, husbands in our culture today feel like if they just provide food and shelter for their families, they're doing a good job. But can I challenge us this morning? Even possums do that. Even animals do that. They can provide adequate food and shelter for their homes. That's not the standard I want to set as men. That we need to step up and set the bar for our families, for our churches, because they will suffer if we don't. If we don't. We live in a culture full of fatherlessness. It's, It's an epidemic. And all the research points to this. And I quote, As supported from the data, children from fatherless homes are more likely to be poor, become involved in drug and alcohol abuse, drop out of school, suffer from mental and emotional problems, boys are more likely to be involved in crime, and girls more likely to become pregnant as teens. We cannot drop the ball. Our families will suffer. Think about it this way. The Bible is full of kings and leaders who failed their families. King David, one of the greatest kings listed in scripture, failed his family. 
he had sons and generations after him that he failed, that he failed and it hurt him. Our greatest ministry is in the home. See, but we both have a job and this is where it applies to all of us, whether you're married or not. The only way we can love sacrificially is if we're fully submitted to Christ, fully under his leadership. That's the only way we can do it. Why? Because as sinful people, the last thing I want to do as a selfish, sinful person is put someone above myself. So I can't do it without Christ. I can't lead effectively. That's why the verse says, we love because he first loved us. If you want to start loving, you need to love God and be loved by God. Would you stand up all across this place? And let me challenge you to read the end of the chapter because it applies to this. But Peter continues, not just husbands and wives, but continues with everyone. A challenge to everyone of loving each other. God's way. And can I challenge you? If you want to change the world, you can't just look just like it. We cannot change the world and not be different from it. We are called to be holy, which means set apart. We're called to be different. We're called to love differently. And so we can have a huge impact on the world if we love differently. So I just want to give a, a couple moments as we continue in worship. Like I said, I want to open these altars up. And if your marriage is going great, you should come down anyways. Be filled up in power. Men, I want to give you an opportunity to lead. Bring your family and your kids down and pray over them. Let's lead our households. If you need prayer in any way, wives, you need prayer. Man, I need help supporting my, we want to pray for you. If you've never fully submitted your life to Christ, we want to pray for you. I would love to talk with you. Come find me at the altar. But if there's any other need in this place, like I mentioned, has, you could say, great servant, Pastor Luke, but I got something going on in my life that's completely different. This is, the, this is your chance. God wants to move in your life. And we want to pray with you and for you. So Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you gave us the greatest example of what love looks like and sacrificed it all. We pray for everyone in this place in whatever way that you're speaking and moving. We thank you, God, that you're calling us out, challenging us, married or not, to submit to you fully. And we thank you, God, for the move and the faithfulness that you're gonna put on display as we step out in faith, as we worship. We just thank you, God, in your name.